So um, I will be concentrating on um, uh, uh, potential uh, cons some con considerations of uh, risk assessment of uh, genome edited plants. And I also would like to mention that I'm actually uh, biologist working in the lab, uh, I also wor uh, use uh, uh, genome editing techniques and um, I'm not always happy about uh, but, uh, regulations. Anyway, biology is much more interesting <laughs> than regulations, <laughs> but, uh, but still, uh, we all want to, to, to our food to be safe, so, uh, uh, we, uh, we, uh, so, uh, so therefore we actually need to, to look at the potential risks and hazards and we need to, to do some risk assessment and if necessary also risk management. And um, uh, I will also mention EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, uh, several times. I am an expert on EFSA GMO panel, uh, but uh, I'm not representing EFSA here, uh, but, uh, but because EFSA GMO panel is currently working on the SDN1 and SDN2 uh, opinion, which is on site-directed nucleases one and two, which actually are the enzymes that produce this uh, uh, kind of genome-edited uh, plants, then uh, some of the, these considerations may, may actually fi find it their way in the, in the final opinion. Uh, so uh, I will uh, just briefly outline the uh, GMO risk assessment framework in the EU. Uh, uh, then, uh, then I will also uh, remind you about the uh, existing work on uh, risk assessment of site-directed nucleases in, uh, uh, that uh, was previously done by EFSA. And I will uh, uh, tell you about the uh, European Commission mandate that EFSA has uh, to develop opinion on uh, site-directed nucleases 1 and 2 and oligonucleotide-directed nucleases. And then uh, I will finish off with uh, some considerations for risk assessment of genome-edited plants. So uh, uh, EU has a very extensive uh, regulatory network for uh, GMO risk assessment. Uh, this is not a complete list, obviously, of different uh, directives and regulations, uh, but the, the, the fundamental uh, part of the a legal network is uh, Directive 2001-18, which uh, sets out what the GMO is, what the uh, techniques are, and so on. And then the, the other one is uh, 1829, uh, which is on uh, genetically modified food and feed and implementing regulation, which uh, details how the GMOs are um, risk assessed. Uh, uh, Directive 18-2001, uh, uh, actually defines what the GMO is, and uh, I will not uh, um, uh, talk about that in much detail. Uh, but, uh, but of course, the, the, uh, because you define what a GMO is by using a definition of techniques that produce GMOs, then you basically are talking about a process that is used to create GMOs. So re GMO regulation in, in the EU is largely process-based. Um, there are also uh, two notable exemptions uh, mentioned in this, uh, in this uh, directive. And the first one is uh, uh, on techniques that are not uh, considered to result in genetic modification. And the second exemption is on, uh, on uh, techniques, methods of genetic modification that are excluded from the directive. And uh, this, this is the famous uh, or notorious uh, mutagenesis exemption that a lot of people were considering that um, uh, organisms produced by site-directed nucleases, including CRISPR-Cas, would, um, uh, would be exempt from, from the GMO directive. Um, however, uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago, European Court of Justice produced a, a, a judgment on what a uh, which basically stated uh, that uh, organisms obtained by mutagenesis are GMOs, and uh, therefore all the requirements laid out in the Directive 2001-18 uh, are uh, applicable to these, um, uh, to these organisms. So in, in, in principle, that means that uh, the current thinking is that, okay, uh, these, uh, these uh, or organisms produced by mutagenesis techniques are GMOs, but some of, some of them may, may be exempt, like uh, the ones produced by uh, uh, chemical or radiation mutagenesis, which are considered to be uh, 
to have a history of safe use, and then uh, there, there are those that are produced using new techniques, and then these are um, obviously the ones that uh, uh, for which uh, 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 GMO directive uh, applies. Um, in in the EU, risk uh, risk assessment and risk uh, management are um, uh, fairly um, considered to be two distinct uh, sides of the of the coin. Um, and EFSA, European Food Safety Authority, is involved in uh, um, risk assessment. Uh, also, in, uh, to pro they they produce uh, scientific opinion on um, on. Uh, uh, GMOs and also many other things, of course, and then uh, risk management uh, is carried out by by GRC, of course, uh, by European Commission, by by national competent authorities, and so on. <laughs> and because we are here at ICGEB and GRC, obviously, I need uh, to mention that if we uh, if somebody is really interested in uh, risk management issues, then, then there is a, an excellent uh, piece of uh, excellent report, uh, very recent, that uh, actually mentions uh, 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 detection of food and feed uh, products obtained by new mutagenesis techniques. So if, if you are interested in uh, risk management issues of uh, genome-edited uh, organisms, then this is the place to, to refer to. Uh, but I will be uh, uh, speaking mostly about uh, risk, risk assessment. So historically, um, EFSA has already produced a scientific opinion on uh, site-directed nucleases 3, uh, which was done, it was done in 2012, and, uh, and uh, it also, uh, why, why it is interesting is because this, uh, uh, this uh, piece of uh, uh, this opinion introduced these three scenarios for uh, uh, for uh, for uh, uh, genome modification, and uh, the the third scenario, site-directed nuclease three, obviously is the one that results in a conventional GMO because a piece of uh, DNA is inserted into a genome. It could be uh, from the same species, then it's uh, cisgenic or it could be transgenic. But anyway, it's a classical GMO, and that there are these two. Uh, scenarios SDN1 and SDN2, which result either in a, oh, well different types of uh, mutations uh, that uh, that uh, were discussed uh, extensively this morning already. Uh, so uh, uh, the conclusion for SDN3 was that on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, less information may, may be needed for risk assessment of uh, organisms produced by SDN3, because uh, these uh, double-stranded DNA breaks could be introduced at specifically defined locations, and uh, that that would uh, be uh, that would make the risk assessment of these organisms uh, easier and uh, less information is required. Therefore, um, I will skip these slides because they really outline the uh, the, the, the CRISPR-Cas technology. But I, I should also mention that uh, these uh, mutagenesis uh, techniques are not just CRISPR-Cas, but also zinc fingers and talons. And in fact, some, some of the products that may or may not be coming to the European market are produced not by CRISPR-Cas yet, but by, uh, by talons, for instance, like uh, Calix, Kalino, high oil lake acid, soy, uh, soybean oil, which was produced, this, this organism was produced by Talents, and uh, there are some others. Uh, there, yes, of course. Uh, uh, with the new technology, I mean, the, the technology is virtually exploding, so uh, new technology, um, techniques are coming out every day, and, um, and the modifications of new techniques are appearing very rapidly. So the, the point is that uh, we are all excited about these technologies, but we don't necessarily immediately see how uh, what is the uh, what what potential problems could could be with these technologies. We are still uh, it's not like we are uh, we know exactly what is happening in the cell when when some uh, 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 enzyme nuclease is uh, is cutting up DNA. So um, uh, there are some two examples of. Uh, these off-target effects that happen in, in and, and I know these are in human cell lines, but uh, there are uh, off-target effects in, in, in on the RNA level. 
So uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it would be good to have at least a look at potential uh, issues that may arise with the uh, with, uh, use of new technologies. So um, EFSA was recently mandated uh, to, uh, to um, uh, develop a, a scientific opinion on site-directed nucleases 1 and 2 and all oligonucleotide-directed mutagenesis. Um, uh, and uh, basically this, uh, this mandate uh, uh, really refers back to the uh, si opinion on site-directed nucleases 3. So that's, that's why I talked about it, even though it is not necessarily a case of genome editing. Um, so we need to look at the assessment methodology uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the opinion for site-directed nucleases uh, 3 and uh, to see if it uh, still applies um, to, to plants developed with type 1 and type 2 site-directed nucleases. And uh, then if... if, if uh, uh, this risk assessment methodology applies, then we uh, need to address um, uh, to see if these conclusions are, and considerations that we developed for SDN3, then if, if they are still valid for, for plants uh, developed uh, through site directed nuclease 1 and 2. Uh, so what does it, uh, what, what actually are these uh, uh, what is this uh, uh, section four for uh, uh, risk assessment methodology for site-directed nucleases three? So it basically talks about hazard identification, and uh, so the uh, it uh, there are several groups of uh, specific hazards that are that it considers. So it's source of genes and safety of gene products, and you can immediately see that this part no longer applies to genome edited plants, mostly. Um, there, are, there are also other alter, alterations to the genome at target site, so these could be gene interruptions, uh, creation of new open reading frames, there could be uh, uh, off-target effects and uh, the expression of the trait. Um, conclusions for the SDN3, as I already mentioned, um, uh, implied that uh, on a case-by-case -case basis lesser amount of event-specific data may be needed. And uh, it also asked for uh, flexibility in data requirements for risk assessment. Um, so how does it relate to, to site-directed nucleases 1 and 2? So basically the, the primary idea is that if no external DNA is introduced, then risk assessment of, uh, of uh, foreign genes or newly expressed proteins is actually not needed. Um, so, but, but that assumes that the constructs for uh, introducing these nucleases in the cell, they are not present there. And that can be achieved either by these um, uh, DNA-free delivery techniques that we were mentioned uh, just uh, previously. It can be achieved by uh, uh, crossing out uh, the, these constructs uh, if, if the crop is uh, uh, if, if, if that can be done, it, it doesn't work for vegetatively propagated crops, obviously, and so on. So, um, uh, but then, if, if these constructs are present, then, they, then these organisms actually are GMOs, and then they, the regular GMO risk assessment applies. Um, so, uh, so what actually... But, but if we talk only about genome-edited plants containing no foreign DNA, then we are talking about editing of endogenous genes or gene uh, or regulatory elements and so on. Uh, so uh, these, and obviously these are uh, modified in a targeted, predictable way. So there are specific amino acid changes that are introduced or there are uh, specific uh, and specific changes that in the promoter regions and so on. So these are, these are changes that can easily be uh, uh, risk assessed. Uh, and I know that they, some of them would be very, very difficult to, uh, to uh, detect and they would create uh, very large problems for, uh, for risk managers, but, uh, but for risk assessment it, it may be a little bit easier. And then uh, some of these uh, changes um, um, 
uh, may actually be very similar to already known natural variation or, or previously in induced uh, variation, uh, like uh, an example would be in uh, mutations in uh, acetolactate synthase gene that create uh, tolerance to, to herbicides. So the, these mutations are known. Uh, they, they can be uh, created by conventional mutagenesis. Uh, they, they are not uh, considered to be GMOs. Or they can be created by uh, methods of genetic modification, or they can be created by genome editing techniques. And some, some, in some, uh, and for some of these mutations, uh, concept of history of safe use may be applicable. Uh, but uh, but for some of these, uh, some of some some of these uh, mutations can be actually quite novel. So uh, this is uh, this is one of these cases where. Uh, um, Flexibility would be required, uh, and uh, uh, and depending on the on the available information, um, different amounts of data would be needed. And of course, uh, off-target changes can also be induced. But uh, as you already heard, uh, there are uh, strategies to reduce these off-target effects. Uh, but uh, but uh, and uh, and. Uh, there are also some experimental techniques and, and bioinformatic approaches that can uh, can help to identify and uh, reduce these um, off-target effects. So uh, uh, um, this is a rough schematic uh, uh, that I would say uh, that I would propose for um, uh, risk assessment of genome edited organisms. So the primary question really is if if there is foreign DNA present in a genome edited organism? If yes, then it's a standard GMO and assessed as such. If no, then it is a GMO risk assessment with le much less information required and uh, um, much more flexibility needed because there will be uh, extremely uh, different uh, cases depending on the kind of uh, uh, editing and uh, and so on, but basically, uh, uh, the, uh, there is um, no indication uh, that um, uh, that uh, uh, the, the the whole GMO risk assessment process could uh, could be invalid. So basically, um, if uh, I, I think the, the 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 idea is to follow the the usual comparative risk assessment risk, risk assessment approach. Uh, less information will be asked needed for molecular characterization because there is no foreign DNA. Uh, because there is no, there are no newly expressed proteins, there will be less information needed for food and uh, feed uh, risk assessment, like toxicology and allergenicity. Um, uh, there will be no uh, issues with the uh, potential for horizontal gene transfer, which is uh, environmental risk assessment section, so on. But uh, but um, but the general approach would still uh, remain. So uh, now we are coming to conclusions. Uh, so uh, because the technologies are developing very fast, I would say that uh, one of the biggest complicating factors for risk assessment of genome edited organisms. Uh, may be linked to diversity of these technological solutions, which create uh, different different uncertainties, depending on uh, basic, basic ed editors, double-stranded DNA breaks, um, nicases, and so on. So it's there could be some uh, different uncertainties in each case. Um, so. Uh, as I, uh, as I already mentioned, if the nuclease constructs are present, then these are, are assessed as conventional GMOs. But if no foreign DNA is present, um, uh, then significantly less information may be needed for risk assessment. Um, and uh, it would be actually very important to consider uh, the previously available information for, uh, about, uh, on, on, the, on the changes that were uh, 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 that were introduced in, in during the genome editing process because some of them were, may be well known, so, while well, some of them may be completely novel. Um, so with that, I would uh, like to finish. Uh, I, I would like to thank my, my university for tolerating uh, my long and extensive travel to EFSA, and I, I would obviously like to thank EFSA for, uh, for providing me opportunity to work on this uh, risk, uh, risk uh, assessment 
uh, issues, and I thank you for attention, and I will be very happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.